All right, everybody. Thank you for being here with the Growing Band Director podcast. This is uh, uh, an, a show entitled How to Become a Collegiate Music Major. I'm here with my good friend, Jeff. Jeff, how are you doing today? Great. How are you, Kyle? Good. How many shows are you writing for marching bands? I'm on the second one now. I, I don't want to count them right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be discussing here with you. We have a good friend of mine, Nate Gowan, who's actually a former student um, from the school that I teach in in Westbrook. And Nate class was- Class 2010. <laughs> class of 2010. That's right. Nate, how are you doing today? Doing wonderful. Thank you. I'm, ca I'm calling in from uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where I'm the director of uh, uh, admissions for the music program. So happy, happy to be here. So in that position, um, what do you do? I mean, I wear several hats, but the, the, to sum it all up in a sentence, I'm the fella at the front door of our music program for any um, prospective students, um, usually uh, uh, seniors or, or juniors in high school who are um, looking to get involved in our, in our music program. Typically music majors, um, but I very often run encounter students who are looking to be like minors in music or even just want to just play in ensembles. They're just curious about what they can do here. So um, I'm the guy at the front of the house to say, hey, come on in, let me show you what, you, what we got. That's awesome. And when you were in, in our bands, I never, I never really, uh, you know, it's funny, you never know what a kid is going to end up going on and doing, right? And I've learned that over the years, and Jeff knows that very well. Like, I never thought you'd be, are you the, are you the, like the music registrar? That's, that's the wrong word. A uh, little, little inaccurate. Um, you got the registrar, which is like the big, you know, conglomerate of yeah. all the things for prospective students. I'm kind of just the local guy. I'm, I'm just okay. here in the music program specifically, which is very, very refreshing compared to the red tape sailing that can go on in upper administration. But it's funny, like of all the things I thought that you'd be doing, you know, I never really, I never really thought that. So r remind us where you went to school and what your musical background is. Sure. After I graduated from Westbrook High School, I, um, I, ultimately wound up graduating from the University of Southern Maine in music, um, jazz performance specifically. I hit things. I play drums and percussion. Um, after that, on the recommendation of an alumni I, uh, of UMass Amherst, I checked out UMass Amherst having no idea what it was about and went here um, for a, a graduate program in jazz composition and arranging, which was really, really awesome. I was a teaching assistant, which was actually in a way even more awesome than just the studies alone. And this position opened up right around the time I was graduating, basically. I applied, they must have liked me, and, I've, and I'm still here. I'll be hitting my five-year mark in the position uh, come November. Um, so I must have done something right. <laughs> awesome. Jeff, in all your years, um, is there some, like, what sort of kids go on to be music majors, in your opinion? I find it <clears throat> the, the driven kids go on to be music kids, music majors. Uh, and then there's the marginal kid. I had one student, he was, he was um, a good player, but never did anything fantastic. We said, hey, I want to major in music. And he went on to major in music and uh, he's on his third Grammy award now for composition. So I think life has been pretty good for him. It just was, uh, he needed the focus of being totally immersed in music and not having distractions on the outside. And that helped him. But then a lot of the other kids have gone on. They've, uh, and they've, they've majored. I, the kids that I had that went to Amherst, they did UMass Amherst, they, they loved it. And uh, they were real close to Tommy, Hannah, and, and the whole crew. And um, so they, uh, they had a great time there. They, it taught them a lot. And they went on to become a professional percussionist and um, did a great job. And um, I think that I just find it's the driven kid. And it's also the child who, sometimes is very high end educationally and has a choice between music or pre-med and they go to music and some of them stick with it but then when they go for the graduate degree then they go on to the pre-med stuff or the law degree or then there's the kid who gets into the music tries it out as a teacher for four or five years and says you know i loved it but it's not my direction. And they go back for a graduate degree in another area 
And what they learned from it has helped them into their different professions, many of which have gone into the business of uh, sales, high-end sales, pharmaceuticals, and uh, stuff like that. So um, before we go through all the stuff with Nate, um, and just to break it down, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the search process for students, um, the application process, involvement, like what can you do and what are you going to do, um, and then sort of some action steps that you can take um, for those kids. Um, I really wanted to quickly share p with people my story. Um, in true Kyle Smith fashion, I was not prepared at all. It was sort of like February of my senior year, and I'm like, oh, what are we going to do? I don't know. But, you know, this was back in the dark ages, Jeff. It was 1996, 1997. And <laughs> I just, I remember saying, well, I really like hanging out in the band room. I want to keep doing that. I was one of those, you know, there's a line in one of these movies. What is it? Um, a high school musical? No, not high school musical. I forget <laughs> what, what, what it is, but it's one of these where like the kid is just, uh, I'm usually in the band room during band, study hall, and sometimes physics class. You know, it's like one of those kids that I just like being in the band room. And I said, you know what? We always go to the Clark Terry Jazz Festival at UNH. I wonder if I should go there. So a big hats off and thank you, if I have not thanked him before, to Craig Skeffington, who was my band director at the time. And he took a day off of work and drove me down to UNH in his own vehicle. We stopped at mm. uh, fast food, of course, on the way up. And, uh, um, and I had my trumpet audition with Dr. Stibler and I ended up getting a great scholarship and it was like the perfect place for me to go. I had zero backups. I had no other, it was like sort of divinely inspired and uh, it turned mm -hmm. out to be a great, a great place for me. Andy Boysen came there a year later and I had a great trumpet teacher and saw Clark Terry six times a year and life was, it sort of prepared me as well as I could ask. So, um, I would not recommend that to anybody, you know, <laughs> waiting to the last minute and saying a prayer and leaving. But uh, I, I find that our approach now is much, much better. So, Nate, I'm hoping you can, you know, teach us some stuff here. I was, I was going to say, I, I mean, I love that story, but you're, you're, you were the kind of student that gives me the willies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> as yeah. far as, um, but, but truthfully, though, you know, there is no, there, there is no, you know, correct college search process because everyone's going to go about it differently. Whether it's a story like your own or the 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 the, the junior sophomore in high school, I, I swear I've seen at least one sophomore come to my desk, which is like, you got three years, please live a little before you think about college. But there is there is no right answer. But when it comes to searching, you know, for schools, and again, and just a drop of my story and my undergraduate experience, I was the one. I was the kind of guy who transferred schools where I went first was not USM and where I wound up, you know, even interest wise changed over the course of time. But, but nonetheless, when it comes to searching, I kind of boil it down to um, three basic concepts, you know, regardless of what you're, regardless of anything else is this, the first rule is the real estate rule location. Um, you know, whether you're looking at, you know, urban versus rural, whether far from home, not so far from home, yeah. Um, what's the campus like? What's the music facility like? What are the venues like? That's all location setting. Um, and really, really important, I would say to, let's, how should I phrase? I would caution against anyone ever signing up a lot of money and a lot of time to a, a collegiate program without having first visited it. <laughs> yep. The feeling you get when you walk on that campus is like half of it, right? Like I could oh, yeah. be here or nope, this is not for me. Yep. Yep. yep, and the internet has beautiful pictures. I tell you this trade secret: they only put the prettiest pictures on the website, you know. Yep. Um, and so, location, you know, is is kind of is is a and everything related to it is a huge, huge thing, and honestly, a big first. Um, the second thing, and and this is the first question I ask students when they come to me, is so what do you want to talk about? And by that I mean what sort of involvement do they want in, in, in music, you know, specifically in this context in, in, out of the school, whether they're looking to be, you know, pull themselves up in a practice room and be the best Grammy winner they can be in seven years time, or do they want to, um, you know, again, just kind of be in that, I just want to do ensembles. I just want to do marching band at UMass. I get that a lot. <laughs> yep. um, I just want to, <laughs> you, you know, you know, Jeff. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, and so, and, and so take a look, taking a look at how, like, are there like major specific ensembles or aren't there? How many ensembles are there? What sorts? Um, there's, there's a lot of different questions one can ask in the simple question of, 
of involvement. And I mean, heck, involvement doesn't even necessarily mean on stage. If you don't plan to take the horn out again, do you at least want to go see concerts? What are what's going on? You know, um, what's what's happening on campus or around campus? And musically, that piques your interest. So to me, involvement, you know, kind of speaks to that point. Can I, I ask one? Can I ask a question? Yeah. One of the things that um, I did as a high school director, and then when I started working at the college that I worked at, was I, I also talked to the kids about who do you want to study with and mm. why do you want to study with them on your principal instrument? Because I find that that, that connection between the, their major instrument professor is sometimes the thing that carries them safely through their collegiate career or to changes their mind on the direction of their collegiate career. That is, that is absolutely correct. Um, you know, and that's something I, I, I would consider only only completely necessary for anyone really looking to major in music especially in performance aspect maybe if you're like into the you know music ed or something in the whole music theory or music history thing when you're hanging out more with academic faculty maybe that's not as much a priority but that being said if you're still taking lessons yeah you still want to know if that teacher is going to yell with you and I know um our program like many others would offer like sample lessons you know free sample lessons students so give that half hour that chance I always joke that auditions are a two-way street. You know, we're obviously taking a look at you <laughs> to see whether or not, you know, you're right for the program, but any prospective student has a chance to audition us to see, is this, is this school the right fit for me? Is this, is this person, heck, is this person the right fit for me to be a teacher um, privately? So that, that is a huge thing. I, I, it's hard to say it universally because I know I see a lot of students, maybe that isn't a priority, but yeah, oh, that's stu stupidly important. I, I find with the kids who are going into music ed, it's become more and more because they still want to continue pursuing the advancement on their instrument. Mm -hmm. And they want to make sure that the person they're working with is going to lead them in a the direction they want to go. And the other thing I think is from a marketing standpoint, and that is that parents of today are looking at how much school costs. Oh, yeah. And they want to know what bang for their buck they're going to get. So yes, you're auditioning them to see if they're qualified for your school, but mm -hmm. the parents and the student, but more so the parents are going from a marketing standpoint, is my child going to get enough that I have to take out those loans, those FAFSA loans to keep that child going through four years of school and right. not be totally bankrupt at the end of the tunnel? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Cost, cost, cost is a factor that, that can't be can't be ignored here and and agreed. That being said, it's always going to come to play. Sorry. One other thing I, w I wanted to jump in about was the university versus the college. And um, for me, like if a kid is asking me, I usually try to steer them towards a university because if they're a music major and then they decide they want to go to an English major or something else, that's not as cool, but they decide they want to do it. Well, then they can stay within the university many times and not have to transfer schools. Right. Whereas if you're at like a say you're at a New England conservatory for something and then you want to transfer to be a business major, like you have to go somewhere else. Right. Um, that is, yeah. So that's that's, you know, I, I put that out there. Sorry for leaving you guys for a couple minutes. That's all good. I'm back now, <laughs> <laughs> which which kind of dovetails to my third, you know, kind of point for just the general just the general search process uh, I would prescribe to any anyone out there looking at schools is what sort of degree are you looking at whether whether it's um you know whether it's music or not you know if, if you're if you got an idea in your back pocket you know the idea of maybe maybe someday i want to consider that sort of business program you know does the school offer it which again speaks to that university kind of got a huge menu of options versus the conservatory sort of idea which has got one option which they do like maybe world-class levels of well but if you want to do something else add something else you might be out of luck, um, you know. So, so between location, involvement, and what's on the menu, degree-wise, what you want to see, those are kind of the general parameters. Obviously, things like cost, faculty, you know, those will all come into play. But for a level starting of a playing field for just general search, I mean, location alone is going to steer the boat so so much. But it's funny. It's funny. One thing I always say to students who are looking at music ed or not. As I always say, I, you know, I was always taught that if you can earn money doing something you love that helps people, 
mm-hmm. then you're gonna have a great life, right? So to me, it's like, do you, if you really want to help people, you want a steady job and you want it to be in music, then music ed's a good way to go. I had a girl recently who said, well, I hate kids. I'm like, well, you shouldn't be a music ed major, right? <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's, it's obviously finding the right, the right fit for you. So, um, so yeah, let's keep going. Cool. Um, you wanted to chat about like general application processes. Was that, was that it, Kyle? Or? Yeah. So what, what is the what next is step? Next? So assuming you've been searching around, you've been, you've been looking at every parameter, you know, and, and you've got, you know, a number of schools in mind. I, I generally would recommend, you know, somewhere between four to four to four to eight, maybe. I think double digits is too many. Three, I mean, I'm not going to go into that, the, the idea of how many schools that it, it's, it's completely, that, that, that could be a whole other podcast of why it doesn't yeah. really matter. Um, <laughs> Um, but just as far as the general application process goes, I mean, I can describe the UMass process like the back of my hand because I run it. Um, but but I'm just thinking thinking broadly, having looked at many schools over the years, there's, I think, generally speaking, sort of three steps. The rule of three is very fun, and I like to stick to it. Um, three steps that you might typically see in applying for a music program. Um, the first step is a, um, an application to the general college or university when, in which the music program is housed. Mm-hmm. Um, so to use my own backyard as a reference, we are at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. That takes a common application, which is the thing most students are going to run into anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's an application to the big, big school. Um, sometimes private conservatories will skip this step. <laughs> um, I'll explain that a little more in a minute, but that's sort of the general step one. Um, step two is the application to the music program. You've gone from the general and now you're getting more specific. I can tell you this, most major you know, college admissions offices will not care what instrument you audition on. <laughs> they care more about the more practical stuff, you, you, you know, whether it's test scores, grades, letters of recommendation, what have you. But we obviously care a lot about what instrument you're auditioning on. That mm-hmm. depends a lot. Um, so there's usually a separate application to the music program, um, often in the form of even something like signing up for an audition um, or pre-screening videos or something. There, there's something that you have to do specific for music to sign up a little further. And then step three is just the audition itself in whatever form it takes. And every school has somebody like you whose job is to help people who are looking, right? So I, I always tell kids, you know, you know, if you want to, well, find the person who knows all the ins and outs of what you're asking and then ask them, not me. Yes, I would, I would love to say that that's a universal. I can't say for sure if it is, though. Um, some, I would say this. A lot of places will have a someone like me but it might not have the title to go with it. Um, you know, sometimes even just the general secretary of the program is, can be your best friend as far as even just pointing you in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Sometimes even the faculty themselves will take a hand in helping to make sure things go along. Um, you know, we're one of the most well-staffed um, departments on campus, the Department of Music and Dance. And that's because we've got so much, so much logistical stuff going on and because right. we have this weird process. So I'd like to say yes, um, but it may not. I'm, I might not be as obvious as someone with a but name. But I'm wrong. Name on the door. Okay. Uh, I, I hope you're not. I hope you're not. Well, I, I just never run into a school who didn't. So I'll say. Good. <laughs> no, I hate to be the, na- the naysayer in this group, but uh-huh. years ago, UMass didn't have one of you when when students of mine applied. But then they changed over to that. But then there's other states that have people similar to your position, but not in name of position, as you stated. And then there's some universities where you have to just know the right person. And there is a person that can give you all this information, but it's not named. And, you know, I think things are changing as we're going along with education because of demands of students and demands of their parents, because of the investment they're making that they want to have more information and they want it readily available. And Mm -hmm. uh, I think UMass should be applauded for a what they've done because by having a position such as yours it makes it a more easier transition for the kids because as we all know there's those that think it's the easiest transition in the world to go to college as a freshman and in truth that's a lie yeah that's a total lie <laughs> and i have a, a question Nate. this is just on top of off the top of my head um for those people do you get does umass have a performance degree oh yeah okay 
fact, Sorry, we got, actually, we got sort of two different flavors faster. too, <laughs> but yes. Um, the reason I ask is what would you say to somebody who says, well, you know, I'm going to pay however many tens of thousands of dollars a year to come for performance degree. Why mm -hmm. don't I just find the best teacher I can study with that teacher and in two years have saved, you know, 90% of the money I was going to spend yeah. and get a performance degree unofficially because in the end, mm -hmm. what I care about is how I play. Sure. But the problem is they miss out on all the theory and all of the history and all the compositional tools and the advancement of their intellectual development in music and outside of music when they do it the way you just cited, Kyle. Actually, and one more thing, which in a way is as important, if not more important, but completely invisible, completely invisible compared to those things that you just mentioned, Jeff, is the subtle and ever important art of networking. It's, it's that idea which I warn students about. If you, want to, if you want to be the best performance major you can, hang out in the common room and meet people, <laughs> um, you know, because mm. that's going to be very, very important in your life and times somehow. It's going to be very, very tricky to make your career be amazing as a performer and just hole up in a practice room all the time. Nate, that's um, an amazing, that's an amazing point. I have to be honest with you because I, you know, we all look back on our, our, our journeys, right? You get your first high school band job. I need a percussion teacher. All right. Let me get a friend who was a percussionist in college. Yes. You know, I need a color guard person who did color guard in college. Right. Yeah. Um, in Maine. Now we have two public universities in the university system that have full-time band director jobs. It's mm -hmm. um, USM and you, you, uh, you may or no, and both of them are college friends of mine at UNH. <laughs> and you know it just it's and not that i had anything to do with it but like you're right the people you meet there sort of create your web as you go out so thank you yeah, for convincing and, me and i can use i can once again use umass i have three of my former students that went to umass uh specifically because they wanted to study with tommy yep. and tommy hannum and uh, then they went on through connections with tommy and other people from umass and the cadets and they all played in blast and now they all play on broadway um hmm because of all those connections they made. And uh, I think that's something that kids and parents forget that in the business we're in music, whether it be music ed, music performance, music composition, music technology, it is all about network networking. And that's how you develop your, your net of contacts. Jeff, you mentioned Tom Hannum a couple of times now for the people who don't know who Tom Hannum is, would you give us a rundown? Tom Hannum is probably the most noted percussionist uh, especially through his dealings and compositions with uh, Star of Indiana, uh, with uh, Cadets of Bergen County, uh, with the Minuteman Marching Band at University of Massachusetts. But the litany of students, the litany, wrong word, the number of students he has put out into the world in the percussion world, not in just marching band, but in concert band, uh, any kind of orchestral playing, jazz playing, it is enormous. And um, he is, he is one of the biggest draws for students to go to the University of Massachusetts if they're a percussionist. And for the years that he worked with the Minuteman Marching Band, which as Nate pointed out, a lot of kids say, I wanna be in the marching band. Well, there's a lot more to UMass than just the marching band because the concert program is phenomenal. Um, the, um, Tommy, Tommy is a big draw. All of my kids, because he has an organization or had an organization called Mobile Percussion. And when I first started teaching high school in the 70s, I had Tommy come down and work with my group and we struck, struck up a friendship there. And he and I used to use one another for things all the time. Um, fantastic human being, fantastic musician, just great guy all around. And UMass is, should be thrilled to have had him on their staff for all the years he's been there. Thank you. Um, so let's just to start talking about sort of involvement. You know, say you, you know, what do you want to do? What's going on locally, minoring in music, uh, other stuff like that, Nate. So what do we have to think about for what sure. kids want to do? Yeah. You know, um, in, involvement takes a lot of ways and I've kind of touched on a lot of them already. So if this is, this is a rehash or maybe you're just joining us, who knows? Um, <laughs> but the idea of, um, um, you know, even just, just the ensembles, just looking at the menu of the different types of ensembles that we offer and therein, what do they do? When do they perform? Where do they perform? Um, yep. It's one thing to say, I want to do the marching band. It's another thing to ask, 
how much does the marching band march? <laughs> you know, um, so each ensemble in its own right has a lot of different questions that you can you can I'm, ask. About. I'm curious about the minor in music because that's something yeah. I've never really, never to be honest with you, in all these years, I don't really understand. Like, what is a? I know it's a, just a much lesser amount of requirements than a music mm -hmm. ed. I'm sorry, a music major, yeah. but. So, so when, when should they, because I always have all these kids, I'm going to major in political science and minor in music. I'm like, what, are you going to have time to do that? How do you, like, <laughs> sometimes I hear kids just say they're going to minor in music because they want to keep playing, right? So can you demystify the actual minor in music for us? Absolutely. In general terms, just, just to give a broader, broader thing, a minor is a slice of a major. Um, so it's just ima imagine, a, you know, a major is a full piece of pie. You're just, you're just taking a slice out of it. Um, it's, it's, so it's, just a fraction of the number of requirements that are expected. Um, I will tell you this, a minor is going to look a little different at every school, just as much as a major in music yep. is going to look a little different at every school. Um, so therein lies the question, you know, if you were to minor in music, what can you expect to do? Is, are there lessons? Are there private lessons as part of the minor? Um, it, are there ensemble requirements? How many sort of just, you know, academic, you know, music theory or history? sort of courses? Um, are there a number of semesters um, that it takes to, to get done? Does it take an audition to get involved? Some minors are just like, come on in, water's fine. Some of them are like, no, you got it. You got to pass. Um, can you start it before you enroll? Can you start it sometime during? After, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of different, a lot of different ways you can go about it. But the idea being, um, when it comes to involvement, a minor, I like to say, is a step up um, from simply just doing ensembles. Um, but not nearly as much as, you know, diving into the deep end as, as, you know, being a full-time music major would be. Interesting. We've talked about money. I have a student who Jeff and I both know very well, who just graduated this past year. He came to me three days before he was going to, his, his last day of school at Westbrook High School. And he said, uh, I think I want a minor in music. I said, well, why do you say that? He said, well, almost everything the school I'm going to, um, requires for minor, I'm going to do anyway. And I was just talking to our aspirations counselor and she said, I've got $40,000 sitting here that I can't give to anybody because nobody in this class is minoring in music. So I have all this cash that I could send your way if you were minoring in music. So he, he said, okay, I'm minoring in music. <laughs> and, you know, he's a great musician and I caught the band director where he's going and it's a, it looks like it's going to be a happy marriage. Oh. You know, just the technicality of moving to the minor in music and not just playing in the concert band, a jazz band kind of thing, you know, earned him a lot of money. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, and that's another good question too, you know, for, for any students down the road, does it, does the minor have a gateway to scholarship or something cool like that? Some, all, not all places do. I know I'll be, I'll be honest. We're not, we're not one of them. Sadly, we can only offer our scholarship money to majors only, but nonetheless, if that's a factor, because cost is a thing, check it out. Yeah. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Congrats, congrats to that student. That's great. You got to tell me who that is him. later. I will. We're going to miss him. <laughs> um okay so what's next well give us the general timeline for kids who are actually okay now i need to actually fill out my applications and do all these yeah. things so you don't do the kyle smith method and you don't wait till february no uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get more about that i promise um so the general timeline it's it's my humble opinion that staying organized about the college application and search process this is the single hardest thing about it. It's actually way harder than any audition, harder than any SAT. It's, it's, it's the hardest thing. So trying to bear down on deadlines um, for applications and auditions, whatever it is you're looking at, is the what's next. Um, common applications, which is kind of the big application, those suckers are due anywhere from November to January, depending on the school. Um, so that's kind of a big first step. Most most junior seniors will know exactly what the common application is. I know guidance counselors are really on board with helping make that swing. All right, great. That's awesome. So what's next for kids? What's the timeline? So one of the, the timeline, oh man, it's when it comes to the timeline of things and how auditions and applications and deadlines and all that stuff, I'm going to tell you all, for, for high school students applying to colleges, that's the hardest part. It's actually staying organized about all that stuff, in my opinion, is the single most difficult part of the application process. Harder than any audition. It's harder than any SAT scores. It's, it's just 
the art of staying organized as a prospective music student, to me, it just, it's just screamingly tricky between all the different audition requirements, states, deadline, it's, just, it's, a, it's, it's wild. So I try very, very hard to keep things in perspective and to boil things down to the symbols. And, and I think, you know, again, it's sort of, I, I'll just stick to my rule of three because that's easy. <laughs> um, but the, the first major step to be aware of is this thing called the common application. Um, that's, that's kind of the big sort of the big what's next. And most junior seniors in high school are gonna get a lot of guidance, literally from guidance counselors about how that works. Um, most of the common applications for schools are due typically anywhere between November and January, you know, somewhere in those in those months. Of their senior year. Of their of their senior year. Yep, absolutely. Um, sidebar, you know, there's these things called early action and early decision. Those are really hip and could take another podcast to describe, but the long story short is um, early action, non-binding, and a chance to hear back earlier from the school you like. Early decision is totally binding. And if you get in at early decision, you better really like that school because you only have one chance to jump on board. That's that's the reader's digest version of those two things. So if you hear early decision, sit up a little straighter. Um, anyway, so that's kind of step one, that mm -hmm. common application thing. Um, you know, being aware of deadlines, every school is going to have a slightly different goalpost. Yep. Um, auditions. Um, proper for most schools are generally happening anywhere between December and March. Um, and, I know for oh, and yeah. the early and the earlier you can audition, the better. And from and what I've been talking to to who I talk to who deals with stuff like this, because they say you know we have a meeting every month and we start allocating our money, you know. And if you're the last auditioner, we may have given away all of our money. You may be the best tuba player, but we've already given it to three others. I'm going to demystify that by a little bit and say that is not a that is not how every school works. Um, some will and some won't. So I will say to your credit and honestly to your benefit, audition early, get it out of the way if for no other reason. Um, but that being said, a lot of schools like us, I'll, I'll peek, let you peek behind my curtain when I say we will wait until after all auditions have passed before we start making these decisions. Interesting. That's, we find that a more equitable way to do things. Now, you're absolutely right. A lot of other schools will go out as they go, and they might reach that that bottom of that barrel. And have have you? Do you know if you've lost any kids who they haven't heard whether they got in or not, and they got an offer somewhere else and went there because you guys waited? Occasionally, okay. it occasionally happens, but oftentimes it's because it's a school they wanted to go to more than us anyway. Sure. Um, yeah. And if they, in other words, if they considered us really that seriously, they'd have waited to learn everything. Because that brings me to the final deadline here conveniently, which is May 1. The 1st of May pretty much is the universal deadline for deciding where you want to go to school, notwithstanding early decision or any of that crap. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the your decision date. You got to make up your mind by then as to where you want to go to school. Otherwise, scholarship offers and things like that tend to evaporate because of rules bigger than you or me. <laughs> and anybody who teaches high school knows about that May 1 date because all your seniors are doing mm -hmm. that. I also learned a long time ago that you're going to be missing a lot of seniors in February. For some reason, our, our kids who go out and audition always audition in February. So it's like every Friday rehearsal, mm -hmm. there's some kids out because they're off auditioning. But that's just part of it. No, that's about right. I think February is pretty much the high watermark time for auditions. I know that, that's when we hold ours. We're holding, sometimes we squeeze one at the end of January, but this next year, every single one. Well, in, in so many, so many schools, when it comes to March, March is like the crazy month, right? Um, we're doing everything every weekend. So if they want a chance to audition, they know they have to get it in before like yep. the, that, that fall, that winter festival season. Yep, Absolutely. But, um, but those are kind of the three, you know, goalposts to keep in mind, the idea of this common application, the audition, and then just May 1 looming. And then, of course, as you're well aware, after May 1 passes, you get a whole bunch of lazy seniors <laughs> for the next couple of months. <laughs> Can I throw a monkey wrench into this whole thing? Please. That is, that is I would this, expect this, nothing this, less, Jeff. Thank I'd you very much. nothing less. This nasty word that I, I know you need to talk about just a brief moment about, it's called FAFSA. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you talk about, I think this is where many people fall into the uh, abyss 
because they didn't listen to their guidance counselors. They'll go through the whole process of doing the Common Core application. They'll go and they'll take the audition, but the FAFSA, they neglected to do, or because of problems with their parents' income taxes or what have you, they didn't file them in a timely fashion. Could you address the FAFSA um, monster? <laughs> For no other better word. The beast. And that's one, that is one thing, you know, I, I'm always one to encourage, you know, high school's age students to handle as much of this college application by yourself as a budding grown up that you are as you can. The one exception to that is what you have just described. I would never, ever actively encourage a high school student to tackle a passport by themselves. That is terrifying. In fact, you will need mommy and daddy's help to make it work um, because it is a beast and it does need to be done. A lot of schools, are even so strict as to say, you're not even gonna be able to get financial aid from us unless that is complete. Correct, right. My carrot, the carrot I like to dangle is especially for students who, where money is an object and you gotta, you need some what, extra help wherever you can. That could be an extra help from wherever you can potential. I mean, we've all, notwithstanding the obvious stories of, what do you mean I'm not needy enough? <laughs> you know, what do you mean we're not? our expected family contribution is that high. That makes no sense. I'm not here to end the nightmare, only try to explain it. When I say that there can be, um, you know, some more interest happy loans, there can be some grants. My favorite is work study, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the FAFSA federal aid is where you get work study funds. And to me, that's like, I, I wish every student could have work study, you know, because I know being a college student is stressful and difficult. But if the idea of having a practical job on campus, which you are pay getting paid money for, in addition to whatever scholarship you might already have, right. I mean, that goes right on your resume. And we offer jobs like right here in the music program. Imagine working box office or backstage at, a, at the main venue on campus or, um, you know, um, being uh, one of the stagehands for our recitals. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, that one is so lovely. And, and the only way you're really going to get for that is is through just through that federal aid application and so that's that's the carrot i i generally dangle is to say look if nothing else try at least for that glorious resume booster um it's a lot of work not gonna lie but man i know the work study students around here at umass are some of the most go-getter students that i know and and yeah i, I feel jeff, for did them. You, jeff did you do a work study job when you were in college they didn't have that back then, Kyle. Okay. But what I did do is I taught in a private studio where I had 30 private saxophone and clarinet students to, uh, that was my work study. And uh, things, things were a little bit different back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. But my three sons who were in their late 30s and 40s were all music majors and they all did work study yeah. when they were in college. And some of them from that networking we talked about before created a great network because they worked specifically with individual professors in their work study programs and learned a ton of stuff from their oh, yeah. and, and, okay, so, so and the, the opportunities to teach at local public schools too are huge and have mm -hmm. private lessons and i had three kids who came in their parents were like we'll pay each 20 dollars an hour if you teach all three of our sons together and i was like what okay and that was that was <laughs> the best and um, my actual work study job was with unh security so i worked nine to two three nights a week that was like it was, I, it was fun. I like looking back on it of those days. But, so you were a bouncer? Well, no, it was like we walk around with flashlights and make sure stuff is locked. And, oh, uh, okay. you know, I thought you were going to say you were the bouncer, you know. know. There, was a, there was a long line of music majors who had done security, so you kind of get it in through, through that. <laughs> but, so there are work-study jobs that are music-related and then totally random other jobs, too. Oh, yeah. I know our favorite around here, weirdly enough, a lot of, and I don't know what it is, a lot of the marching band specifically, but a lot of music students, you know, the, the local transit bus driver yep. has been really popular as like, it pays extremely well. It's not even a work study gig so much as just a campus job, but I know it got so, it got so marching band heavy with, with marching band students and the transit services, the, 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 the heads of scheduling for the driving services had to actively wonder when the games were so that they know how much of their staff wasn't going to be available. Yeah, the band's playing. We imagine. don't have any buses running today. Yep. <laughs> so it's like, oh, like oh, he's coming up for <laughs> staff. Oh, man. All right. So say you're going to a school and you've you've accepted and all that. Um, summertime visiting campus. What's 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 the benefits of that? Um, generally speaking, you know, if, if you've accepted, you know, 
the best time to visit campus to experience it, I tend to think is, is well before you, you've deposited, you know, and, and um, you know, like this summer, for example, I'm, I'm having, you know, for seniors and even a couple of juniors in high school come by and visit campus. Um, but after you enroll that summer prior to, you right. know, that's where new student orientation starts to happen. That's where you get, um, you start signing up for classes, you get advising, um, you get to campus to like, you know, have all the good, what I call find the loud rock. Find the dining hall and yep. all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Well, that's that's first, stuff. first place you go, the practice rooms in the dining hall. Right. You, you got eat. those two down, you're all set. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's one thing we skipped and I just want to jump back to it real quick. It, uh, in, in my mind, you know, is the opportunity, if you're going to be a music major, to like while you're auditioning or maybe after you've been accepted or something before you decide to go there to actually take a day, get off of your high school, go down and shadow for a day. Did we talk about that? Did, I don't know if I missed that or not, but you know, where you, you, you get, you know, and I, I'm sure you guys do that like a lot of other schools do, but mm -hmm. I remember vividly being, you know, the best trumpet player or one of the best trumpet players in, in high school and feeling good about myself and all that. And then, then sitting at the end of the trumpet section at University of New Hampshire and Trent Austin is playing first trumpet. Woo. And we're playing this piece that like, I played like a quarter of the notes. And I remember, <laughs> and everybody was so nice. I remember leaving going, I got to come here because like, I am nothing here. And I really want to be around people who are better than me. And it really opened up my eyes to like, oh my gosh, I'm not leading this band. You know, they are so much better than me, you know? And then within a couple of years, I was sort of near the top of that band, but you know, I always tell kids, if you go sit somewhere and you're literally the best player and you're not even in that in college yet, you probably should go somewhere else because you're not going to, you know, you're not, you're going to be the big fish in a little pond. It's, it's so awesome. I, I remember vividly, I had one student visitor last year who had that kind of that experience. I, I, I he was, he was sitting in our, in our, um, he was a saxophone player. He sat in with the big band um, here on campus and I, I didn't stick around for the rehearsal. It's not what I do, but I met up with him afterward to make sure he found the exit and all that. And I said, how did it go? He didn't say much. He was one of the quieter visitors. The first words out of his mouth, I need to go practice more. Yep. And I was like, yeah, kid, you know what's up. <laughs> and, and, and that was, that was just kind of that, uh, you know, cause, cause I see it from the back end up, but they're seeing it from the front. So yes, yes, yes. The idea of getting to campus, learning the best resources for learning about the program really are the students. And the mm -hmm. office can can set you up with shadowing with a student and yep. with a, a full day schedule kind of thing. Yep. Whether it's people like me coordinating things, a lot of the time faculty will just kind of take the reins and like it's like it's like say it's the trumpet faculty be like, oh yeah, I know I know this guy will be really good to carry up with or whatever. I mean, there's there's somebody there who won't make things go. It kind of harkens back to the beginning of who do I call? Whether it's a director of admissions or a general office or even just the faculty direct. If the faculty doesn't want to hear from you, they'll route you to someone who does because they want you to come. And that's another, that's another example of networking, right? Always being nice to people, never burning any bridges. Right? Oh, yeah. You want to you want to make sure, cause yeah, people want to help you. Yep. I, I think the other thing that on those visits, that's always been important for my students has been that not only to meet the person that's going to be the head of their studio for their particular instrument, but to go and sit in a theory class. Mm -hmm. Kid, you know, you take theory in high school and you get, and you may take AP theory and you get a flavor of it, but to sit in theory and understand this is one of the backbones, the main tenets of getting your degree is to understand, learn this and develop it. And um, I think that to me always, as I watched kids that I worked with at the university I taught at, that that was the breaking point of whether they were going to move forward or not. If they couldn't handle theory, then they weren't going to move forward. They could possibly handle the private instruction, but the intellectual part of understanding the theory, the composition, the oral and oral needs of perform of, of studying music is a real crux to a lot of kids. And I, I would dare say that many of your kids might be great players, but if the kids you lose are the ones that just can't hack theory. That's where that's where their stumbling block is. Yeah, sure. I mean, sitting in on classes comes with the course. Uh, uh, that was a bad pun. Um, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, no, that, that is so. There, there is that academic element that, that certainly, you know, can't, can't be ignored, you know, especially for our, our, our music, you know, major majors for, for absolute certain. 
because I'm sure you don't want to get a lot of kids to come in and then at the end of their first semester, second semester, freshman year disappear because you want your continuity mm -hmm. of students to keep going. So you have to make sure you sort them. So I assume that in your audition process, there's still a written and an oral theory test to see how well the student functions within those confines. As so, we do have a small theory diagnostic exam as part of ours. A lot of schools do. And that's just to kind of get a sense of like, it's kind of the, to really address the folks who, you know, the, the proverbial student who um, can, can play, can, can play super, 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 super well, but maybe they only ever learn by ear, <laughs> you know, and, and don't know how to read a note on a page. And that's, obviously really as a proverbial student to say the least but that's still important and 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 for sure something does, does it do. does a kid ever not get into the university because of their theory test for us and ours no it's 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 at, at the very least if someone does poorly we'll just put them in a more fundamentals oriented theory course at yeah. the start we'll help them get their feet wet um so i know it certainly doesn't it doesn't bear that factor at least in my backyard whether or not that that level of looseness applies to other programs i'm not sure mm -hmm. um, i feel like a new england conservatory would have a much different vibe than you know bob's university of of everything you know what i mean it's 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 so check that's a good question 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 questions by all means keep a list of questions and may that be one of them and the know. reason i emphasize that is not directed at your university but that's directed to our podcast listeners as high school directors i know kyle does this real well and I know the schools I taught at, there is a department that did it well. High school band directors, orchestra directors, choral directors, your kids need to study theory in high school. It's not all about singing, playing a horn, playing a percussion instrument, playing a stringed instrument, playing a keyboard instrument. That it's, You've got to teach them theory so that they are prepared so that it makes it a more enjoyable journey through the process of music. And, and, and the trick, the trick for me is trying to do that in the full band because, you know, we have a number of kids who don't take theory, can't take theory. In our school, we have one theory class and that's it. We don't have a theory two or AP theory or anything like that. I would love to have that, but the way our schedule works out, everything works really well, but we don't have that opportunity. And mm -hmm. so, you know, finding the ways to make sure you're teaching theory as much as you can within a full band setting. I remember, Nate, you were actually in school. I attempted to do music theory, like 10 minutes of theory time every band class. Of course, I was a first year teacher at that school. I had been teaching four years. That lasted about a week. And I had parents complaining, you know, well, this isn't theory class, you know, this is band class. And as much as I was correct and they were wrong, in the end, they were really right. Like they're there to play. We don't want to take binders and literally be writing music for half the class. And so the trick I found is finding ways to teach that music theory within the context of your band rehearsal. And to me, the biggest thing that I, I will get on my soapbox about um, till the end of time is teaching your kids to learn their scales, all yeah. the scales, not just the scale, like learn all the scales. And, and we've talked about this in past episodes, but you can like the method I use for learning scales and sorry for going off on a tangent here is, you know, I have a scale grid. We go by note name rather than what it looks like. And then we, we have the circle of fifths or fourths or whatever you want to call it. And we play just column one. So you play C and then F and then B flat and then E flat and then A flat and then D flat and all the way around. You just play that one note. And then you play the one, two of every major scale. And then one, two, three of it. So that's months and months and months. But then before you know it, like for us, by the time our kids finish freshman year, they can play all their major scales and they can read them on the page to see what the key signature looks like. And that's a very sort of thoughtful process. But I've had many years of kids going on to music who say, I, I got to school and I was way ahead of all my friends because I just knew all my scales. Hmm. So that's my plug for knowing your scales. It's <laughs> it, what, what does Mike Tyson say? I think he said, you know, using the punching bag is not boxing, but it helps prepare you for boxing. <laughs> so to me, music, you know, the musical punching bag is your scales. We don't play music because we love playing in B flat major. We do. We play our scales because it gets us ready to play music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, Sorry. If, if you want a, an itty bitty anecdote for me remembering, you know, early Mr. Smith at Westbrook High School, because yeah. we were we were your first freshman. That was that you was were. A, was a you, you were you were actually old enough though that you didn't have mrs smith you that is you, that when, is also correct when we came on you were the you were the last class who actually didn't have have her as middle school teacher mm -hmm. that is absolutely the so great but, mr baffa yep oh miss him yeah miss him in any case um 
I, I can recall the first time vividly re learning about what a minor scale was. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I heard the sound for years, of course, but I had no concept of what that meant. And for whatever reason, it might've been arabesque. It, might, it was something, I, I don't remember the context, but you explained the notion of how you, 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 you take this note of this scale and just bop it down a little bit and bop this other, and then you have this completely new sound. And I can vividly remember that class. And I was in the back in percussion picking my nose, just kidding. Yes. Um, you know. Yeah, but you were one of those percussionists who actually like paid attention all the time. You know, you're an oboe player in a percussionist body. Uh, thank, thank you, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, but all the same, I can remember that vividly, you, you know, to, to this day thinking to myself, oh, that's what that is? Well, that sounds cool, <laughs> you know? And and, and, just, and I was, I thank you for remembering that. that. That makes me feel good. I don't remember that at all. Um, but somehow I was able to take that and in probably 30 seconds or less explain it, yeah. right? And then that helped yeah. you, you learn that, so. Little itty bitty things and it, yep. it was but G I minor think, too. It's still G my minor. And, be, G and, minor. Be, and because of G minor, you're now at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in your position. You Absolutely. <laughs> so as, as we wrap up, is there anything that we have not discussed or anything that we've cut off that we haven't talked to people about? Do students have the ability to access you after they're in during their freshman year to help them along the path for a sophomore, junior, and senior way year? Certainly, certainly. I, I, I personally keep an open door policy, but more so than that, um, though 99% of what I do indeed is outward facing, part of that, I, I literally have to draw on current students to help me. You know, I, was, uh, I have a sign up list outside my office for anyone who wants to volunteer to be, um, you know, someone who wants to be in touch um, with prospective students. So I have to keep my network, Aha, there it is. I have to keep my network alive during their time here. Um, one of the other things I do is like, I have a career services aspect to my job. So I will, and that could be another podcast easily, um, you know, the notion of, you know, students meeting with me to discuss, you know, like, how would I, I just got into this professional ensemble, how would I, how do I approach doing this? I'm, I'm a mm -hmm. little kid again. Um, you know, I'm starting to get wrapped up with school. How do I do this? Uh, internships, what's going on? You know, so I have a lot of students who would interact me with me on that point. Mm -hmm. um, but even then, even now, I get, you know, inquiries from students being like, hey, how about this? How about that? Because I've been their first point of contact. Sure. So I'm the easiest one to, to get to know. But that being said, props and big spotlight on the person they meet next, which is our academic advisor full time for the department who helps make their lives go and then their faculty they're going to have a whole life beyond me but I'm still the first person they know and if I had a nickel for every time I've been asked hey I don't know if you know the answer to this question but I'm going to ask you anyway yeah <laughs> uh, and, and I think that's an important factor because I think what happens to many music students in big institutions such as yours is after they get in the door and the first week or two over they get lost oh yeah <laughs> because they get lost and they don't have that they don't want to necessarily go to the academic counselor that they're assigned to because it may say something about how they're studying and they need somebody who's a neutral party yet totally immersed in the music department to help them move forward. And I think, I think that's a point that in your recruitment you can push because parents want to know that. Is there a neutral body within the music department that can be a source of consolation, a discussion, further moving forward. And you're that person for UMass Amherst. I, I can be, yeah. I know we have a, a very strong staff. We have an undergraduate coordinator who helps make things go. She's she's amazing, you know, another another major point for undergraduate affairs. Um, and if often I don't know a thing immediately that they're curious about, I'll say, we'll talk to her. We'll help you figure it out. And she'll probably help you out with a lot of other things you don't know you need to, right. and, and so on and so forth, so. Well, Nate, if anybody wants to reach out to you and ask questions either about UMass Amherst or in general about this, what's the easiest way for them to reach out to you? Um, email's easy. Um, you know, music admissions at umass.edu. Hey, it's easy. Um, this is my contact. Um, I, got, I still use a phone, heard of those. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, phone or email. Uh, and, um, you know, either which way, um, send up a smoke signal or come by and visit. You know, I, I always encourage live visits, especially, you know, now that we know what it's like. And I assume not. if a kid goes on UMass Music, you know, website, they'd be able to find you. Oh, yeah. You, you Google up UMass Music. Um, there's an undergraduate admissions page section of my emails plastered hither and hither. And hither. Um, 
I'm not too tricky to find. Beautiful. Well, Nate, it's been really great catching up with you. Indeed. I'm no, very proud you. of everything very you've much. done. Yep. No, no, and, thank you. And, well, I'm remembering Tom Hannum, by the way, well, he's, as, as we know, he is no longer the, right. Longer our, our, our fellow, but we have a new fellow, Ian Hale, by the way, I don't know if you know Jeff, um, but he's been doing amazing work in his first year alone. So great. Yeah, I knew Tommy had retired. I was just talking back in my mm -hmm. era, which is a little different thing. We're Kyle. still in your era, Jeff. We're still in your era. Oh, yeah. yeah right. as, as the great Clark Terry would say, everybody, keep on keeping on. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.